Uh, first of all, Senator, I know you're a busy man. I want to thank you for taking the time uh, to do this, to have the direct access to Senator Tim Scott has been a, a great blessing to me and, and to my constituency. And thank you for working uh, through uh, the various committees that were necessary to facilitate some kind of uh, relief for people who are suffering. I want to start with the business aspect of it, the small business aspect of it. Tell me a little bit about what this uh, new uh, small business and entrepreneurship paycheck protection program does for small businesses. Yes, sir. So, uh, A, thank you for your positive, powerful, biblical leadership uh, every day, but specifically during these days of a crisis, uh, I, I am watching Bishop Jakes uh, on the Word Network. I'm, I'm doing a, a review of the ones I missed when I was in Washington. So this oh, is a great wow. time for me to catch up, but we are all blessed by your leadership. Uh, I'll jump into the legislation now quickly. The small business part of it is $350 billion designed as a loan that becomes a grant if you use it for stated purposes. There are two stated purposes. The first purpose is to meet up to eight weeks of payroll. And the second purpose is to have some resources that covers your overhead, your rent or your mortgage, your utilities and benefits for your employees. Those are what we call forgivable expenses along with payroll. So the way that it works, and, and I know this is, uh, if I go too fast, Bishop, please slow me down. I've said this too many times and uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it's 250% of monthly payroll. Let's stop there for a minute and go back yes. and unpack that a little bit because when, yes. uh, when our people hear a loan uh, from the government, they're going to be terrified. I, I want them to understand that if it meets the qualifications of what you described for the expenses, for the maintenance of the company, for mortgages, utilities, or what have you, or to make payroll, uh, then that loan, uh, as you say, is a grant, which means, it, the, first of all, the loan doesn't come due for a year, okay? So right. a year before you would ever even have to pay the loan. If you took the money and used it for something outside of the orbit of what it has been designated for, then it becomes a loan. You don't have to pay it back for a year. If you use it for salaries, for mortgages, to keep your business going, uh, to sustain yourself, and there are some criteria, and let's talk about that in a moment, then at the time that the loan becomes due, it becomes a grant, the government will give it to you. You don't have to pay anything back for it at all. It is to keep you afloat during this time. Am I correct, Senator? Pretty much. I'll just say it my way. Just uh, the only part I would uh, put a little question mark behind is to sustain yourself. Uh, those are words that could be interpreted by different people. But if your definition of sustaining yourself as a business person mm -hmm. is taking care of your payroll and the place where you rent or have a mortgage on for your business, the answer is 100% correct. The goal is to provide for those overhead expenses and your payroll. If you use the money for those targeted items, it becomes a grant. And I will say, I understand the hesitancy to say the government is here to help me. When I say that, I have to laugh out loud sometimes because rarely is that the case. And so having some uh, you know, skepticism when you hear the government's coming to help you uh, is interesting and probably smart. In this case, and the only reason why this is the case as it relates to this grant program and loan program is the government said, shut your doors. The government required through quarantines and through social distancing in order to save approximately a million lives, we have gone through this really aggressive approach to saying to businesses and frankly to houses of worship, to churches, please do not hold a service, at least in South Carolina, with three or more people and 10 people or more uh, is uh, really a frown 
frowned upon around the country. And we've seen even in Florida where they arrested a mega church pastor for having a service that was basically full to the brim. So this is a way for us to solve that problem as it relates to resources. Uh, the goal is to provide resources because the government is sharing the, the responsibility from a healthcare epidemic, trying to find a way to slow the, to, to flatten the curve. We're making exceptions to small businesses and to nonprofits to be able to have access to enough liquidity to keep your employees on the payroll and to pay the rent or the mortgage for a short period of time, hoping that as we head into summer, we will have a far, we'll be in a far better position. So we've got three categories. We've got churches who are eligible for this. We've got small businesses who are eligible for this. And we've not not for profits who are eligible for this. So if you're running a CDC, a EDC, if you're running a, a home for battered women, if you're running a, a shelter for children and, and it is a not for profit, if you're running a hospital, uh, if you're running any other not for profit, you have the wherewithal to be able to use this. Let's talk a little bit about the grant as it relates to the salary cap that you and I discussed earlier. Uh, what level of salaries it will reimburse you for without consequence. Yes, sir. So this is envision, it envisions a, a salary no more than uh, $100,000 is the number that uh, I'm it's gone up. Point. Sure. Sir? It's gone up. I had heard 80. Well, 80. Yeah. So it's been, so there are definitely two buckets of money. I'll get clarification. But the, uh, so when you're, when you're borrowing the money, the amount of the payroll that we will uh, pay for or make into a grant is up to $100,000. Now, that means any salary up to $100,000, that doesn't mean a $100,000 cap for the whole payroll. Correct. That's for an individual. Individual. So if you have 25 people that are making $50,000, $60,000 in 85000 and up to $100,000, you are able to get that money borrowed from an SBA loan through the bank uh, that will pay those people. And, and that um, loan is not due till a year. And if you can show that you used it for its intended purpose, the government will absolve the expense since they took responsibility for shutting us down in the first place. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, good. Okay, so I wanted to be clear about that. When it comes to accessing these funds, is it the bank the only place where you can go and what types of banks and what language do we need to go in there with? What is going to be expected for us to bring as uh, small business owners or church leaders? So, what the, uh, so yes, it's banks. So the SBA program 7A, a 7 Apple, 7A program is an already established program that expanded the definition of who can qualify for a small business to include nonprofits uh, and churches within the nonprofits. Uh, there are uh, 800 financial institutions, typically banks around the country, who are already processing 7 8 loans. Those same institutions will continue to process the new iteration of the 7A loans. That would include all the major players in the finance world, from your Bank of America to your Wells Fargo, City, uh, Chase. In addition to that, there's another 795 financial institutions that are already approved. Secretary Mnuchin has said that his goal within the next 10 days or two weeks is to expand that to 4,000 plus additional banks, credit unions, and fintech lenders so as to not allow for the bottleneck that we anticipate occurring to you know, stop the process from moving as quickly as possible to get the resources in. Okay, say for instance, I'm self-employed, I'm a, a nail tech, uh, I'm a barber, I'm a hairstylist, and I'm self-employed and I have my own business. Does that also apply? Yes, well, the first time uh, you, the, 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 the key of course, is the reduction of payroll is the key. For some small businesses, they, if you work for yourself, I, I have relatives who 
have a full-time job and then they're part-time. Uh, they do hair, they do hair, they're hairstylists, some, some of them are barbers, some are uh, plumbers even. So these folks who are self-employed, they can qualify for the loans, but the loans are based on a loss of payroll or revenues. But if you lose revenue, but you don't have a payroll, then you don't qualify for the loan. So you have to have a payroll in order to qualify for that loan. That is, there's a different conversation we'll have, in, I assume in a few minutes, as it relates to unemployment and how that works. But for the small business loan, it's based on payroll. So the ability to borrow money is 250% of your payroll. So if you don't have a payroll as a small business, then that would be a, that would be a different conversation altogether. Let's talk about the 250% because what that breaks down to is so many weeks of pay. Is that right? Exactly. The, the way that it's envisioned, Bishop Jakes, is that's eight weeks of actual payroll. Uh, obviously, 250% is actually 10 weeks of payroll, but the last two weeks isn't to be used for payroll. It's to be used for overhead expenses. It's to be used for uh, other things that will, you know, the utility, your benefits, your rent, your mortgage is what that other two weeks, so to speak, two weeks is for. Well, I have to admit, I, I had my people at the bank before the bill was passed. <laughs> well, you are wiser and smarter than almost all of us, so I can understand why that would be the case. Well, the big concern is my biggest uh, concern. And Bishop Jakes, may I interrupt you for a second? Sure. Uh, earlier, we were talking about the 100000 or eighty four, what it was, and, and I said I was going to double check myself because if I'm giving out information that's not quite accurate, I want to correct it on the fly. Right. Uh, the hundred thousand is accurate. Just uh, I, I had a hesitation in my voice because I wanted to make sure that I that, that it was a hundred thousand. It is a hundred thousand. The hundred thousand is accurate. That's even better. Yeah. My biggest concern yeah. is I have three hundred employees in one in one company alone, and uh, my biggest concern was to avoid laying people off. I really didn't want to do that, and so for us, that makes it possible for us not to lay uh, people off uh, as readily as I thought that I might have to, and I was working hard not to do that. And so thank you and thank the government and God and all the angels that uh, he's coming to our rescue. <laughs> yeah, we, we really need that. Yes, Let's talk about those people who are work. Thank you, sir. Let's talk about all those people who have already been laid off. What do they do? Yes, sir. Well, uh, if you were laid off because of the COVID-19, uh, March 1st is the key date. Your business had to be uh, in operation on February the 15th, which is another important date. But let's say the employee was laid off on March 1st. Uh, this is retroactive back to March 1st. So the business would be able to bring those employees back or if they, you know, basically there's uh, two major categories of employees that are laid off, those who are furloughed, who get to keep some of their benefits, but they're without pay, you can bring those folks back. And those who are just literally laid off, you can bring those folks back if it's a business decision. And the other part of it is that the uh, goal is for you to maintain uh, around 90% of your payroll until the year it expires. So you get that 250% loan uh, that becomes a grant, but the way that they're going to calculate that in one year is how consistent was your payroll. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how we help the employee first is by making sure they don't get unemployed. If they are unemployed and the company doesn't bring you back, the federal government is going to provide an additional 16 weeks of enhanced benefit beyond your state's typical oh. unemployment system. That's, that's and I'm happy to go into that if you want me to, sir. I don't know uh, if, if that was uh, the answer you were looking for or yeah. I provided enough clarity already. Yeah, I, I think that, that gives us an overview. Is there a certain uh, approach when they file for unemployment that causes them to be eligible, with certain notations that need to be made, uh, certain applications that need to be filled out? What do they need to ask for? Yes, sir. The good news is uh, this is going to, the, the way that the, the, the system is designed is we're going to specifically provide the resources for those who qualify for unemployment in each state. Uh, you and I had a conversation which was 
uh, once again, one of the reasons why the bill is as solid as it is is because I have a, a good fortune of, of strong uh, biblical leaders uh, whispering in my ears about different aspects of the legislation. Uh, you being one of those in folks, uh, the unemployment benefit for the first time will cover uh, nonprofit employees along with people who are self-employed or are 1099 employee. A lot of churches as well as other businesses, small businesses specifically, have some of their folks who uh, play or work uh, in their businesses, those they pay them by 1099. So if you're laying off your 1099 employee or if you are working for yourself and you, you no longer have business, or if you are, are working at a nonprofit or a church uh, specifically and you, you lose your job, you are now eligible for the $600 enhanced benefit that would last 16 weeks. Uh, and the goal, of course, is for that to be on top of what your state is providing. That's excellent. Now, I understand with a larger institution or company, there is a cap on how much money that fits into that category. If I'm not mistaken, is that $10 million? Yes, sir. For the small business loan, the amount that one can borrow, representing the 250% of your payroll, is a maximum of $10 million. Mm -hmm. And then if you use the money for something other than the payroll or the overhead expenses that I think we've both been very clear on this uh, Skype call, then it becomes a loan with a 10-year note with an interest rate not to exceed 4%. Wow. So you actually can borrow the money and use it for the building fund if you wanted to, but you're going to have to pay it back over 10 years at 4%. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Which is, I think, a very uh, competitive, to be nice, mm. uh, loan uh, amount. It's certainly a gracious amount of time to pay it back, and the interest rate, uh, that's pretty low. Yeah, it's pretty low, especially on a jumbo loan. You can't get down to 4% pretty good. and, and, and uh, Yes, make sir. Let's talk a little bit about the CARES Act. Uh, can you kind of inform us a little bit about uh, what all is in, uh, offered through the CARES Act for people uh, who need information about the health maladies they're facing? Yes, sir. So let me, uh, I'll break down a couple of components of it. And if you have any questions outside of these areas, I'd love to discuss that as well. So a couple of the really, really important areas of it and that I think will be helpful to the of persons throughout this nation is if you make $75,000 or less uh, and you're an adult, you will receive a $1,200 check. This is the kicker, tax-free. Now, it's, 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 it's hard for me to say that because I've never said it before, but I like saying it. As a tax-free check that you're gonna receive in the mail for $1,200 or frankly, if you filed your taxes in 2018 or 2019, you definitely have to file your taxes, by the way, uh, to get the money. Uh, you, you can have a direct deposit. And, and my understanding from the Treasury Department is they're also going to provide further guidance for those who did not do the electronic filing of their taxes, um, a way to get the check electronically. Of course, the electronic check comes faster than the other check. So stay tuned for more information on how to provide information so that you too can get your check electronically. Uh, that's $1,200 for the person making $75,000 or less, for the person making $199,999 and less, up to $75,000. There's a scale where it goes down. For uh, couples, that of course would be $150,000 a household income. And if you have kids in the house, that's uh, and you make less than seventy-five thousand each, or one hundred fifty thousand as a couple, then you get five hundred dollars for every child in the home as well. And just to be clear, that's a one-time check. Yes, sir. The way that it is seen today, according to the legislation that we passed, it is a one-time check. And in your mind, when the Senate passed that bill, their focus is on people who are suffering from COVID. Yes, sir. So the whole theory is that so much of our country now is suffering from COVID-19 that 
it's hard to distinguish those who are not impacted and those who are impacted. Infected is an easier uh, way to deal with it as, as it relates to knowing who's been impacted because you're infected, but there are literally, in my opinion, scores of people who have not been uh, tested who probably are infected because they're asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. So the real question that we're asking ourselves in Washington, and frankly, I ask myself as well, is how do I deal with my nation when the government is requiring social distancing in order to save somewhere around a million lives? Mm -hmm. and the fastest and most effective way to deal with a nation when the government is, re is compelling you to do uh, nothing or less than you were doing is to provide some financial assistance down that path. And so the direct payments really is to stabilize those folks who are being negatively impacted by COVID-19. But the more studying you do, the more you realize it's not just hotels or restaurants or airlines. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the welder, it's the construction company, it's the cities where they're not uh, offering any uh, processes in place to inspect buildings. It's the, uh, everyone around the country is, is experiencing some discomfort or some negative impact to the virus. Therefore, we figured out how to have targeted and temporary relief to help those folks negatively impacted. It just happens to be, as I say, from sea to shining, shining sea. It's the, it's the whole nation that is being impacted at this point. Now, uh, is there a special program allotted for copays and people who are trying to make up the difference uh, between what their insurance requires for the medications or hospital stays or things like that? Yes, sir. So one of the things that happened in the, the phase two of the legislation is that it was uh, it had uh, it had in its uh, free testing for COVID nineteen. Uh, there's another question on what happens after the testing. Uh, and that is still, we're still working that through the system. What we have done in order to help hospitals absorb more patients is we provided about $117 billion to hospitals and healthcare folks in order to uh, deal with the additional costs brought on to the hospital systems by the COVID-19. And you're seeing probably firsthand on most news channels, the uh, building or uh, Constructed, constructing of temporary hospitals in New York City and around New York State because that is the epicenter or ground zero of the, of the COVID-19 uh, spread. So literally you're seeing um, the government's response from hospitalization, uh, other company, uh, co uh, companies, healthcare companies, Humana and Cigna are also waiving expenses. And I can't say it's all expenses, but they're waiving expenses to, because of the COVID-19 for those patients or, or I guess insurers, insurers who are uh, impacted by or infected with COVID-19. I think you'll hear more announcements on that as we move forward. Let me ask you this question. I want to go back to this uh, whole notion of the uh, SBA loan and going uh, after it. I, want to, I neglected to mention something I thought uh, might be important. How stringent are the rules going to be for credit worthiness in order to acquire that loan? Because a lot of us are going to be intimidated. A lot of our people are going to be intimidated because they don't feel credit worthy uh, to go to the bank and they're going to just suffer through it and not go for fear of rejection. Well, there are two things that I think that we, we should all keep in mind that the small business loan process or for those businesses and nonprofits who have either had to lay people off or have had a loss of revenue. If you're in those, one of those two categories, I would say approach your financial institution, number one. Number two, the underwriting will be very different for this loan than it has been for any other loan you've probably been a part of because the United States government is going to back the 100% of the loan. That is never done uh, except for in these really uh, trying times that we're living. So the pandemic itself has brought to, to bear the uh, credit worthiness of the United States government to back the loans of the small businesses, 500 employees or fewer or less, it will be uh, that bucket, $350 billion is federally uh, backed 100%. So the underwriting will be streamlined. And I was on a call with the uh, senators, state senators from South Carolina, 
before I got on the call with you, sir. And I will say that that was one of the things that the uh, chairman of the banking committee was highlighting was that the, there's a one page in South Carolina, there's a one page process to get all your pertinent information before they do the longer uh, process. But the goal is to get this money into the hands of the business owner strategically within seven days uh, after they've applied for the loan. So that is a, yeah, I call it quick, fast, and in a hurry. Yes. That is a very short process. Yes, and, uh, it's one that you should avail yourself to. And go, go in and check it out. Man. At the end of the day, the, the, the worst case scenario is you hear, nah, this is not gonna work for you. But truly, if you've lost revenue in your business and you can prove that you lost it year over year, or you've lost a uh, lace of employees off, well, this is exactly why we designed the program and why we expanded the footprint of the program. And I will say, uh, I'm not a prophet, <laughs> but I will say that if we are able to tackle this virus uh, in the next 60 days or so, I think we'll be back at the drawing board with a package not dissimilar to the one that we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. What about if I'm an immigrant? And, uh, and I need some resources, uh, and, and I'm not a legal immigrant. Uh, do, do the rules apply for me? Is there any assistance for me? Well, you know, back in the 1980s, the uh, hospitals uh, were, were uh, re recalibrated, from my understanding, to allow for anyone who walks into a hospital to get care. That's going to be, that's critical. I think that continues to be the case. This bill does not speak specifically to illegal immigration at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got you. Uh, what did I leave out that's, that you really want people to know and to understand? Yeah, I think there's uh, the, the, you know, we, we live in a country where people are divided. There's racial tensions and, and sometimes animosity. There's partisan bickering. There's uh, challenges between the haves and the have-nots. This is uh, a, a, a an enemy that seeks to destroy. Uh, it's, it's close to the, uh, I think it's a John 10, 10, the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Mm -hmm. uh, there, this is an enemy that does not discriminate, period. Uh, the good news is for the first time in a long time, uh, I'm watching our country come together uh, in a positive, constructive way with no partisan labels, Republicans versus Democrats. Mm -hmm. That is a good thing. So frankly, there is a, big old silver lining in the midst of this challenge where I'm watching families loving each other in a way that they haven't, having dinner with their kids as I talk to people around the country. They're, they're, they're just sharing stories of leaving you know, tips and drive throughs for the McDonald's workers. Uh, I must concede I like the French fries myself and may have been in a drive through or two myself. But uh, I, there's a lot of great stories, but as it relates to the, to the bill itself, uh, Bishop Jakes, the one thing I would say is we provided somewhere around $11 billion to accelerate vaccines. We've provided another $4.3 billion for the CDC. We added in about $45 billion for FEMA for emergency response. This is in South Carolina, we have hurricanes. So this is like having a hurricane season the entire country over. So there are some real specific buckets of money there. And Bishop, this is kind of in the weeds a little bit, but there is, in fact, uh, some resources in the bill that allows for small businesses that are being negatively impacted by cash flow to defer their payroll taxes. Don't pay them this year. You would pay half by the end of 2021 and the other half by the end of 2022. Well, there's resources. Sir? Without penalty? Without penalty. Which is a big deal. Yes, sir. Uh, and also for employers, uh, I've had some people ask the question, well, if all these people go on payroll, my unemployment insurance is going to get higher? Am I going to have to pay more money? And the answer is no. For COVID-19 unemployment, there is not an additional a pain of having to pay higher premiums because of the COVID-19. The other thing I would say, sir, as well, is that every state around this nation will be receiving some portion of $150 billion to provide assistance to states and localities for the 
uh, for, for the additional expenses of COVID-19. And I think of that as a really big deal and a very important engagement, especially when you think about the communities are at risk around the country. Uh, the need for resourcing some of our smaller communities and frankly, some of our larger municipalities is really important. And so we'll have uh, available 117, uh, $117 billion for hospitals, $150 billion for municipalities and states flowing through the states for those communities. And Bishop Jake's like, uh, I can't remember how big Dallas is, but for if your city or is over 500,000 people, you get a direct assistance out of the $150 billion goes straight to your city. That's really important information for those folks around the country. And then there are some other smaller um, buckets of resources as well that we could go over, but that some of that gets into the weeds, uh, like the payroll tax deferral. I'm happy to discuss that or just happy to perhaps give you a synopsis and email it to you if that's a, a little easier. What would be good is where it's can our viewers, where can our viewers go website wise and get down into the details and find out more information? There are different sites to go to for different different pieces of information. My website, uh, my Senate website, Tim Scott Senate, uh, is a place that you can go and get a, a, a distillation of all the information that we've discussed. Um, you can you can. Uh, Probably go to any senator in the country's website. I know you can go to mine. You may want to go to your own home state senator's website first. If you can't get it, go to mine. We have been doing constant updates of the information. I had the good fortune of uh, being on two different uh, task forces for writing this legislation. I was on the finance part that wrote it for the, uh, uh, the larger businesses, mid-sized businesses and larger. There's a different funding mechanism in place for those businesses. Uh, it's about, uh, we put $500 billion in what we call a commercial, commercial paper facility, which is just a fancy way of saying, we're gonna guarantee about $500 billion of mid-size and larger businesses ability to get access to money. That creates about a three and a half trillion dollar uh, line that banks will be able to use to get in to these businesses to provide more liquidity. That money is a loan. Most people on the call may not uh, run a, a, a business for, with more than 500 employees, but if they do, we have some directed, tailored assistance for those folks. I think that's really important to note. Um, that's uh, that's uh, the commercial facility that is run through the Treasury Department. Uh, that's probably the other major piece of the legislation that we didn't spend much time talking about. I assume that uh, we wanted to focus specifically on small businesses, religious organizations, and then direct payments for those folks uh, around the country who make less than $75,000 a year. The final piece, Bishop Jakes, is the piece that speaks to contributions. I was having a conversation with my pastor and probably 75 other pastors around the country, and they noted that the standard deduction basically prevents some of their smaller uh, co contributors from having the same inducement to give. And during this uh, crisis, nonprofits and frankly, churches are gonna have to be the backbone of communities. And so I was able to include in the legislation $300 for folks who wanna make a, a contribution and use the standard deduction. That's a $300 uh, opportunity for folks to do that. For your larger, uh, wealthier investors who want to give more than half their income, the rules before COVID-19 maxed out the amount that you could give to the charity of your choice to 50% of your income. For the rest of this year, you can give 100% of your income, which will be very helpful for some larger contributors. And then for businesses, we had relegated your ability to provide resources to 10% of your profits because of COVID-19, we were able to move that up to 25% uh, of your profits. That's fabulous. So those sorts of things are things that we need to know, include on our websites and help our donors to take advantage of every uh, incentive to give and the benefits of giving to uh, not for profits. And we're very grateful for it. Uh, just before I let you go, I'm going to sidetrack just a little bit and ask you to give me an update 
on opportunity zones? How have they been affected as a result of COVID-19? And how do you see the overall program progressing uh, now that we're over in 2020? We talked about it in 2019. Yes, sir. Uh, so far, so good. We had about, in 2019, we had about $67 billion being uh, put into funds to be deployed around the country. What we've seen in 2020 is a, a slowdown of activity. COVID-19 has taken over the front page of every story, so folks are not uh, as motivated to make those investments. Uh, immediately, the projects and the municipalities and the counties are redirecting their efforts and energies in a different direction. So it's, it's, it's slowed it down some, but the good news is the energy and the optimism around the COVID-19 continues to grow and grow and grow. Um, that's the good news, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> around the opportunity zones continues to grow and grow and grow. That's good news from my perspective. I spent so much time talking about COVID-19. It's- Yeah, it's yeah. puzzle with your head. Yeah. I would, I would think that given the volatility of the stock market, that this would be a, an, uh, a, a good time for people to invest into opportunity zones just from a perspective of stability of investment. You're 100% correct. I mean, I, I've watched our uh, stock market go down from the 28,000 to the 20,000, down 22,000 range, point range. And truth be told, Yes, one of the fastest ways to get the return on your invested dollar is to make a smart investment in real estate. Uh, Opportunity Zones allows you to defer your capital gains tax by seven years, which is fantastic. In other words, instead of having to pay pay your capital gains in in 2020, you could literally defer it to 2026 uh, in order to make an investment, a long-term investment, five-year investment into an area that might need the extra capital. And if you do so, not only do you get to defer your now original capital gains tax, you uh, are going to be able to reduce your capital gains tax that you owe today by 10%. And if you keep your investment for 10 years or longer in the opportunity zone, you walk away with zero capital gains tax in your new investment. Not the one that you owed at the beginning, but the new one. So uh, we still are having I, my understanding is billions of dollars are still coming into funds. The deployment of the dollars has slowed down because of just the challenges around the country with people wanting to focus on real estate and, and, and getting the certificates uh, approved and moved on. But the money is still pouring into some of the accounts, which is really fantastic news. And uh, I'm looking forward to having more conversations about the fact that opportunity knocks and it keeps on knocking. And even during the hardest hit times in our country, people continue to rise up and, and prosper and succeed. And thankfully, uh, the gospel speaks to us about a peace that passes all understanding that's available to us. First Peter 5, 7, Philippians 4, uh, 6. It's really important for us to keep our, our eye on the ball. And the ball is not the coronavirus. The ball is faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for that. I think it's important also to remember that uh, locking in your capital gains benefits now is going to be important in the volatility of the political frontier. We don't know how high capital gains may go over the next 10 years, depending on uh, administrative changes. So if you're going to lock in at a good rate, now it's time to do it. Bishop Jakes, you're going to be my financial guru. Thank you for... uh... (laughs) Taking up the mantle and finishing the statements for me. You're really good at this. I'm going to keep taking notes as I watch the rest of the the episodes I've done. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time and have a blessed day. God bless you, sir. Thank you very much. Y'all take care. Bye-bye.